So let's offer the prayers and then we'll start with today's session. O Magyanati Mirandasya, O Magyanati Mirandasya, Gyanan Jana Shalakaya, Gyanan Jana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Militam Jena, Chakshurun Militam Jena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale, Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale, Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta, Shri Mate Bhakti Swamin Nitinamine, Namaste Saraswate Deve, Namaste Saraswate Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Paschat Yadesha Tarine, Paschat Yadesha Tarine, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabho Nityananda, Prabho Nityananda, Shri Advaita. Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Mukam Karoti Vachalam, Pangum Langhai Tegirin, Yatkripatam Mande, Shri Guru Dinatarinam, Paramananda Madhavam, Shri Chaitanya Ishwaram. So, in the last three sessions, we saw the childhood pastimes of, Krish, of uh, Prabhupada. We saw how wonderful uh, childhood was when it comes to childhood samskaras given by Gaur Mohan Prabhu and Rajini Mataji, the parents of uh, Abhay, Abhay Charan. And then later we saw his college days, how he was a freedom fighter. I mean, he got into the moment of freedom fighting and he was really resonating with all the uh, lectures of Shubhas Chandra Bose and Mahatma Gandhi. Then we saw his meeting with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who shattered <laughs> all his mood of freedom fighting. And then he triggered a very, very nice uh, mood of preaching the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then after that, we saw that how he, he shifted to Allahabad and how he opened the League of uh, Devotees in Jhasi and how he separated from his family. And then in the last session, we saw how Srimad Bhagavatam first came to volume 1, volume 2 and volume 3 were printed. It's really painful to hear you know, what all Srila Prabhupada did you know, to print those three volumes of uh, first came to Srimad Bhagavatam. Very painful. And after... Getting these three volumes of first canto printed, Prabhupada felt he's ready, ready to go to West. Then he approaches Sumati Murarji for the ticket, passport, visa, P form, and uh, the sponsorship, and finally the ticket. And everything was ready. And uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, he came to drop Srila Prabhupada at Kolkata port. And there, Prabhupada was getting onto this ship, which I've displayed here. He was getting onto the ship which is called as Jaladuta. Now Prabhupada is looking at the ship and is meditating that how to fulfill the mission of his spiritual master Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, the order given by his spiritual master. And with that mood, he's climbing the stairs of the ship and he's going onto the ship. When he's walking and all the people on the ship, there were few of them, all of them, they were looking at Srila Prabhupada because they never thought on a cargo ship, which is full of goods, just having a small passenger cabin. In that, a 69-year-old sannyasi in saffron robe is going to travel with them. And Prabhupada was climbing the stairs with one suitcase in one hand and umbrella in the other. And uh, he was looking up and he was going up on this uh, ship, you know, which is uh, displayed here. Now, let's see what happened after this. Hope everyone is with me. Let's uh, start with today's session now. The dream journey, the dream journey of AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami began on 13th August 9 a.m. from Kolkata Port. 
on the ship were captain pandya and his wife and there were other few crew members so it is described that it was a cargo ship so it's you know goods goods are uh, there on the ship and there was a small passenger cabin so prabhupad writes in his diary on the first day 13th august that uh, i'm feeling very comfortable the passenger cabin is comfortable and uh, you know, a lot of arrangements have been made by sumati muraji and i'm feeling good so this is what he writes in his diary so prabhupad would write diary every day so he write he wrote that in his diary on 13th of august then 14th of august he makes an entry in the diary saying that i am feeling sea sickness because now they have crossed you know they are they are in the waters now and there you no know, proper is feeling lot of sea sickness and vomiting and dizziness and along with that there were heavy rains also heavy rains and heavy winds were there so Prabhupada couldn't take that because first time you now he's traveling uh, uh, on the big water body, you know, which is the ocean, and uh, he is not able to comprehend what is happening around. Everywhere water, everywhere water. In fact, it is described that his appetite also went down. His appetite also went down. But on nineteenth August, they reached Sri Lanka, Colombo. So they reached there. So the captain took him out on the, you know, in in a car, and at that time, Prabhupada felt good. He was out on the land again. And then uh, after coming back, again they started. So twentieth August was a very very special day. Twentieth August was Janmashtami. <laughs> so AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami celebrated Janmashtami on the ship. What all things he do did? See wherever devotees are there, uh, some things are fixed. Kirtan is fixed, prasad is fixed, and class is fixed. It doesn't matter where they are. In fact, it's described in Russia when uh, devotees were put in jail, so they didn't have anything. They didn't have uh, any paraphernalia. Nothing was there. But still, it is described. It was Janmashtami, and they were acting. You know, they were celebrating by acting, and they were decorating the entire uh, cell, the jail cell, and uh, they were talking to each other. Oh, I'm cooking this for Krishna. What are you cooking? And and all those discussions are going on. and then uh, a person is sitting and you know he started giving class and other people are uh, singing and you know, they are enacting that they have got uh, some radanga and kartal and other things and the the cops who were seeing this they were going crazy what these people are doing <laughs> <laughs> so basically the point is wherever devotees are they will create the temple atmosphere it doesn't matter if it's a jail or it's a jalalita ship and here is the pure devotee of lord krishna the senapati bhakta of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu you can imagine what atmosphere he might have created so there prabhupad personally cooked for everyone he personally cooked for everyone he had taken the dry cereals he had taken some potatoes and also sumati muraji made uh, sure that there were some vegetables and fruits um, on the ship so he used all that and then he cooked a very nice feast for everyone and then he gave a class on krishna janmashtami to all the available crew members and everyone enjoyed everyone enjoyed that uh, class then this was janmashtami was celebrated next day next day 21st of august was even more special because it was nandotsav and it was actually the birthday of shila prabhupad and shila prabhupad turned 70 on the ship <laughs> i was just meditating on this point that he could have celebrated he could have celebrated janmashtami he could have celebrated his 70th appearance day or birthday in vrindavan but only for one cause to spread this mission of krishna consciousness the message of bhagavad gita all over the world this personality in this ripe age of 69 who became 70 on the ship he started on a very 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 deadly and dangerous journey on jaladutha ship the ship no went towards cochin arrived at cochin and then uh, after that when they came to cochin so from the books uh, the books which were there the shrimad bhagavatam shrimad bhagavatam from uh, bombay they were shipped and uh, those were loaded you know, when uh, they came to cochin now this was all the arrangements done by sumati muraji she made it a point that you know everything is put i was just thinking you know how much uh, mercy sumati muraji might have got you know, assisting a preacher a singer preacher then from cochin the ship started you know, towards the red sea so this is 23rd august that uh, the ship moved you know, towards the red sea now the condition of prabhupad got even more deteriorated a lot a lot 
sea sickness increased vomiting increased dizziness increased he was feeling a lot of uh, weakness and uh, he was not feeling any any appetite you know for taking any prasadam and then along with that something else also happened pain in the chest started and with time it started increasing it started increasing and on that particular day when the chest pain was really very great he got a major heart attack and the next day when he was just recovering he got another major heart attack so you can imagine two major heart attacks back to back what propad would have gone through yes in fact propad writes the diary he says if the third one would have come i would have died right he writes that in the diary when he got the second heart attack and when he was unconscious propad got a dream propad writes this in his diary jalulta diary he says that when i was there on the boat i was there on the boat and krishna and his various incarnations were rowing the boat and krishna was telling that don't worry we are with you just come and propad says that i felt very good you know after uh, getting uh, such amazing darshan of the lord yes just imagine you no know, two heart attacks oh it's, it's very difficult to understand also what he was going through because at the age of 70 getting all these problems is like uh, very very difficult like for us you know if we do a little uh, hard work here and there physical work you know we get tired and we need some rest and this person is traveling from one place to another then he boards the ship and it's very new for him and then along with that he has got these uh, symptoms i mean health problems and along with that two heart attacks now you can imagine the situation of propad on the ship very very dangerous situation very dangerous but again on 1st september they entered suez canal and they stopped at the port said on 2nd september now the captain was very nice arun pandya then I, when the city came now again he took shla propad and he visited the city and propad says i liked it and it was very nice very nice so with time with time you no know, he was he was obviously sick but with time he was recovering you no know, little by little by little and 6 september 6 september he writes that uh, he recovered from the illness and for the first time in two weeks he ate properly the first time in two weeks he ate properly he himself uh, cooked some khichdi and puris and he had that but then again after 3 days 9 september when they entered atlantic ocean the headache started slight headache started it seems so there propad writes in his diary very very touching 10 september's entry he says i'm feeling a lot of separation from vrindavan i don't know what am i doing in this water all side everywhere water and there in between i'm feeling a lot of separation from vrindavan i'm feeling a lot of separation from my govind ji my gopinath ji my radha damodar ji oh where are they and then uh, he writes that uh, i'm completely dependent i'm completely dependent on my gurudev his divine grace bhakti siddhanta sarasthi thakur it's only his mercy that i'm still surviving and it's only his mercy that i'll be able to preach anyways i'm in, you know in my 70s what will i be able to do there it's only his mercy is saying yes. but then he also makes a very important entry he says in all this turbulent situation there is one solace you now which i have that is the nectarian chaitanya charitamrit which he carried him uh, carried with him if you remember he carried a bengali chaitanya charitamrit with him so he's saying in all this turbulence that is happening all around the only thing that is giving me lot of solace lot of peace is chaitanya charitamrit here at this place i would like to make a very important point for all of us so going out of the topic of uh, proper lila see when all of us will be uh, getting to our old age one thing is for sure hmm? one thing is for sure that uh, will become lonely with time will become lonely and to such an extent that people will not care for us around yes at least in this age of kali be it our kids or be it relatives be it friends or anyone for that matter because they themselves have will have their own families you know to care for like you ask a question to yourself how much time are we able to give to our parents it different it difficult because everyone has their own families to maintain right it becomes difficult so when a person becomes old when he crosses uh, say 55 or 60 65 or 70 it's really difficult it's really difficult the person goes through a lot of mental turmoil 
so there's a lot of loneliness within within the heart there's a lot, lot of loneliness and in the head i mean in the mind there's lots of thoughts running this is called as crisis which happens in the old age and in this crisis the person starts thinking what did i do in my entire life and then he sees the entire life is logged is logged for various people around but those people are not taking care of me this is what he says and then when that crisis uh, uh, comes now the person goes you no know, really into a deep thought process and sometimes into depression also and you see you take up uh, maximum old people maximum old people they are very uh, cranky they are very very chidchida in hindi we call it as chidchida for every small thing you no know, they'll uh, they'll go uh, crazy every small thing and they want to give suggestions to people they want to give advice to people because they feel they have got lot of uh, experience and they want to share but now no one is coming and asking <laughs> so they'll catch people and they'll start saying you should do this you should do that and then sometimes uh, when the person is uh, throughout his life he has worked and suddenly has to sit at one place that's very difficult very difficult and then the entire time he has managed the house and suddenly everything is taken away from him all the responsibilities are gone now he is there alone without any responsibility not going to office staying at home there is nothing to do so in this particular scenario it's very very difficult to sustain very very difficult and that is the point you know when the previous samskaras comes into you know picture in fact it is said that budhe pe budhape mein jawani lusty desires pop in even at the old age because of that loneliness which are there and then you might have heard that uh, old men uh, you know raping uh, people uh, raping females and so on and so forth why all this happens that because of the loneliness so one thing we have to understand we see krishna we don't see krishna we attain krishna we don't attain krishna but for sure we'll be attaining our old age <laughs> no one can stop that no one no no old anti aging creams can stop that for sure so one thing that we have to do is prepare every single day for that particular day now which is going to come very soon for all of us for some of us it might be 40 years more some of us 30 years more some of us 20 years more some of us 10 and some of us maybe 5 also so we have to prepare for that because only when we prepare for that we'll be able to relish those moments the preparation is becoming more and more krishna conscious in fact when we come to our old age we should be like that sponge which is completely dipped in the nectar so now when the sponge is removed you know from the nectar say honey so the drops of honey will be falling so basically the point that i'm making is the person should be so dipped in krishna consciousness when the person comes to his old age is completely filled with nectar completely filled with nectar of uh, krishna consciousness anyone who comes in touch with him he also becomes krishna conscious that's how the stage of a person in the old age should be and old age means what and so many bodily problems will be there now just imagine if a person is bedridden he's always on the bed how much frustrated the person will become but if a person is krishna conscious even on the bed what what he, what he will do he'll keep chanting and he'll keep relishing and suppose he has attained krishna till that you know he'll be uh, taking darshan of krishna and he'll be relishing the leelas of krishna and he'll be speaking on the bed itself he'll be speaking about krishna he'll be relishing if no one comes to care for him he'll be okay no one comes to uh, give him attention he'll be okay this is called as solace in turbulent situation and all of us are going to go through that turbulent situation for sure for sure i just talked about the old days but even now there will be some turbulent situations in our life but if every day practice is there of uh, taking shelter of krishna by reading shastra by reading uh, bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavatam by hearing lectures on day to day basis by worshiping krishna by having prasadam and giving up all the sinful activities then that particular shelter will save us or else forget it nothing can save us nothing can save us we'll get into a very very bad turmoil a, a bad situation where we'll not be able to balance ourselves and many people are going through this many people what to talk about old people even people who are there in their adulthood say 35 to 40 even they are facing this problems yes midlife crisis so all this crisis will be taken care if every single day from now itself we practice bhakti very strongly always remember all of us are going to become old for sure and we'll be invalid remember this term invalid we'll become invalid when we enter our old age and no one would care for us at that time because we will be invalid 
No? And at that time, even when we are invalid, still Krishna will take care of us. Yes. And Krishna can reciprocate us with us more if we have been Krishna conscious throughout our life because we'll be drenched and we'll be completely submerged or we'll be drowning in the nectar of Krishna consciousness. That state should come. And that cannot come with a practice of one or two days. It's a practice of years together. So this is what we see in Prabhupada's life. When he has got two heart attacks and when he's going through so much of problem, he's there you know, in the ship and all around is just water. And this person is saying that my only solace is the nectarian Chaitanya Chaitanya. This is the state where what all of us know we have to reach. This, this is the particular state that we have to reach. And Prabhupada would come on the deck. He would stand and he would be watching the entire ocean all around. And then he would watch the sky. He would look at the sky. And then he would be thinking about Vrindavan. He would be thinking about Chaitanya Chaitanya. And he would be meditating on the order of his Guru. How can I fulfill the order of my Guru? <laughs> the captain makes a statement. When they crossed the Atlantic, the captain made a statement saying, he never saw such a calm crossing of Atlantic Ocean. He's always the Atlantic would be turbulent, it seems. No, in his entire career, you know, till that particular day, you know, he made a statement that Atlantic would always be turbulent, always. But this time it has been really very calm. And Prabhupada writes that if Atlantic would have shown the usual face, I would have died. And he says, it's only Krishna's mercy. It's only Krishna's mercy that Atlantic was calm and I'm saved. And there Mrs. Pandya, the wife of captain, she says to Prabhupada that uh, while coming back, please come back with us so that we have the same Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> so that Atlantic remains calm. <laughs> this was the statement which she made. 13th September, after 32 days of travel on the ship, 32 days. Can you imagine 32 days on the ship? It's, imagining itself is so, uh, uh, what to say, scary. So scary. It's, a, it's like a nightmare. 32 days on the ship and you're just seeing water and nothing else. Prabhupada wrote a Bengali poem on the ship and he revealed his entire heart in that poem. Very, very beautiful poem you know, which he has written where he talks about his relationship with his guru. And he, there he mentions that uh, uh, there's a nice, uh, nice lines where he's mentioning about uh, his relationship with Krishna as a friend, and he's saying, "I'm missing, missing those uh, uh, leelas or those days when uh, we would go to herd the cows together." Okay. Prabhupada is writing that, you know, in his uh, song. So something like that, you know. It's a very deep and very esoteric. We'll not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So 13th September, you know, the, it was a 32nd day of travel. 17th September, morning 5.30, they reached Boston's Commonwealth Pyre. They reached that particular place. And then Prabhupada the, went through the US uh, Immigration and Customs. You know, he went, did all that. Then his visa was stamped and the expected date of his departure was put because he just had three months of visa. And then when he, when he was there at Boston, he wrote another poem called Markena Bhagavata Dharma. So that is also a very nice uh, song. Sometime I will sing that. I will sing that uh, sometime later. Yes. So now he has arrived in Boston. Now, just imagine for the first time, an Indian is going to West. Now you might have heard you know, many, many people going to West, uh, US, London, wherever. Mm -hmm. And how they describe. One of my students, a uh, few students have gone and out of that, you know, they describe. Oh, it's a heaven, Prabhuji. It's a heaven here. Hmm? It's so beautiful everywhere. It's so beautiful and uh, you know, so nice and goody goody, whatever. Yes. And you know what Prabhupada was thinking? <laughs> Prabhupada says, This is hellish city life. <laughs> Every person here is illusioned of material happiness. Hmm? Everyone is illusioned. Everyone is just going through, just going through their life. And they don't know what is the goal of life. They're just living animalistic life. This is what Prabhupada writes in his diary. I'm feeling miserable here away from Randavan, he says. This is pure devotee's vision. He's not allured by material things of this world. He was seeing that particular place to be hell. Or that place which is glorified by people around. When Indians go there for the first time, Indians glorify like anything. But this Indian who has gone is not a normal Indian. He's a pure devotee. 
and he is saying that it's a hellish place nothing else is there now let's try to understand propas condition he has come to boston but let's analyze propas condition till now material setbacks he started the league of devotees that failed and then his business failed his uh, you know he separated from his family so many things he went through no support back in india no support now in new york also boston or new york there's no support there and it's not that there's a big setup ready you know to receive uh, shila prabhupada nothing is there no money in fact i forgot to tell you all when prabhupada climbed the stairs of jaladuta he had a trunk he had an umbrella along with that the money that he had was just rupees 40 with 40 rupees he boarded jaladuta and now on the other side where he is going the crowd is horrible it's not like our geeta course crowd like you all yes you people are so humble and so you know you sit so peacefully and so eager to listen about krishna but here the crowd is horrible crowd is horrible yes they are meat eaters and drunkards and the women monglers and you know, gamblers and what is prabhupad going to preach there no meat eating no intoxication <laughs> no illicit sex and no gambling this is what he is going to preach to those people yes he doesn't have any plan how to preach also he does not know what, he does not know the crowd at all entire crowd is foreign for him he doesn't know if his language will be understood by them and their language he can understand i mean the accent yes and along with that the cream was the two heart attacks which he actually went through can you imagine what what was situation of propa completely uh, helpless situation completely helpless now he does not know what to do there only thing that he knows is that i have to spread this mission of krishna consciousness for the welfare of everyone as a service to my spiritual master and krishna only this thing is ringing in his mind and nothing else but one thing is very clear prabhupad had intense faith in the holy name intense faith in the holy name and intense faith in shrimad bhagavatam prabhupad writes in one of his uh, uh, one of the entries in his diary he says that i am tiny i am tiny puny i am tiny insignificant but god is infinite i cannot do anything but he can do everything this is called humility the difference between depression and humility is this a person who is into depression he feels that he is very tiny he is small he is good for nothing and no he doesn't see any support but a person who is humble he sees that he is good for nothing but god is good for everything and he can do everything that is called as humility and prabhupada was really very humble really very humble 19th september then from boston jalalta sailed into new york harbor and it docked at uh, brooklyn pier the 17th street now prabhupada is seeing the manhattan skyline he is seeing the statue of liberty and the millions of visitors you know that he is seeing there but before getting down the ship you know prabhupada did a very nice thing prabhupada sold his bhagavatam set to captain pandya and his wife <laughs> See, this is this is called as one pointed focus. He convinced them to take Shri Bhagavatam set. Now he had twenty dollars with him, so forty rupees plus twenty dollars. And with that, he is getting down from the same ship which he got in at Kolkata port. He is getting down from that place, from that ship. And how was his attire? He was wearing a, he was wearing saffron robes. And uh, in in future, you know, we'll see that. Uh, when newspaper articles are written on shri prabhupad so there they have written that this personality the indian swami is in saffron robes and is wearing uh, what is that bathroom footwear <laughs> something like that so prabhupad had pointed white colored footwear it seems so he was wearing that then he had an umbrella in one hand and suitcase a briefcase in other hand and then he got down there and all the people around were unlike and like shri prabhupad everyone were there in western dress and here prabhupad is there in absolute indian attire complete indian attire in his dhoti kurta and uh, you know in a shawl and he you know a typical footwear having umbrella in the hand and suitcase and other the prabhupad writes in the diary when i got down when i got down i did not know whether to turn right or whether to turn left as not knowing as not understanding what to do and then he writes that uh, you know i entered and i did the dockside formalities you know, whatever formality is supposed to be done then there was a traveler 
there's a traveler uh, aid person who was sent by Gopal Agarwal. If you all remember, who was Gopal Agarwal? Who signed the sponsorship papers for Prabhupada. He was Gopal Agarwal. So he had um, sent a traveler aid person. And then the traveler aid person, he took Prabhupada to Sky India ticket office. Sky India is the, you know, the company which uh, takes care of the ship. And one of them was Jaladuta. And he took him there and then Prabhupada booked his return ticket. He booked his return ticket. And then he was taken to the bus terminal. To, uh, and his uh, trip to Butler, Pennsylvania was arranged where the house of Gopal Agarwal was there. Butler, Pennsylvania. Now let's understand. Now Prabhupada has already boarded the bus and he started. So Prabhupada is looking around and he's seeing big, big, huge buildings. Huge towers are there. And like there's so many vehicles with so much of speed. They're driving, they're going around. And there are people you know, who are just uh, uh, enjoying. And Prabhupada is seeing all this and he's becoming even more sad. That what are these people doing? This is called as compassion of uh, a great devotee. He was very, very compassionate looking at all this. Looking at all this. And he was praying to Krishna that, oh Krishna, please deliver all of them. How will these people get delivered without your mercy? They are all in ignorance. Krishna, they are all in ignorance. Please deliver them. This was the mood of Shla Prabhupada you know, when he was looking out of the bus. Just imagine you know, if we would have been in his place for the first time, we are going, you know, we would have, hey, look that, look this. <laughs> but Prabhupada, he is feeling sad you know, looking at all this. This is on one side. Prabhupada started from uh, this Manhattan and is going towards uh, uh, Butler, Pennsylvania. Now let's understand what's happening in Butler, Pennsylvania, Gopal Agarwal's house. Now Gopal Agarwal had signed the signed the sponsorship for many, many sadhus in the past. Because his father would uh, always help sadhus to come to West. But then no sadhu came actually. No sadhu came. But one day, this uh, Gopal Agarwal's house there was a letter that was received with a photo. And that photo was the photo of Abhay Charanar in the Bhakti Vedanta Swami's photo. And the letter was personally written, written by uh, Bhakti Vedanta Swami. And there Prabhupada writes that uh, I'll be coming at so and so date. And that was seen by Gopal Agarwal's wife. Now Gopal Agarwal is Indian, but he married to a foreigner, a foreign lady. So her name was Sali. So Sali Agarwal. So Sali Agarwal saw the letter and he was shocked. And she calls, honey, come fast. <laughs> Please sit. I want to tell you something. Look at this. This personality is coming. And they were all shocked. They were not prepared. Yes. And now we see 20th September, morning 4 a.m. Prabhupada knocks the door of Gopal's house. <laughs> now you can imagine the situation there. Now what would have happened? They were not at all interested to host the Swamiji. Only because Gopal Agarwal's father had told that, you know, help the sadhu, they were doing something. But they were not at all interested to host you know, the Swami who was going to come. But now anyways, he has come what to do. So they received him. And then the, just described, the house was very small. And uh, you know, it, was, it was very difficult to get adjusted there. So his accommodation was arranged in a different place called YMCA. So there his accommodation was arranged. So what... Uh, Prabhupada would do is he would stay there at night and then in the daytime he would spend the entire day in the house of uh, Gopal Agarwal. Now, this when uh, Prabhupada came the first day, Sally Agarwal was panicking like anything. She was thinking, now what will I answer all my neighbors and my friends? If they ask who is this person, what will I answer? So what she did was immediately she took Prabhupada to a newspaper, uh, this one, office. And that, that newspaper's office uh, was named, uh, that newspaper was Butler Eagle. Mm -hmm. That was the name of uh, the newspaper. And uh, the office of Butler Eagle, they went. And there, she requested them, please write an article on this person. Now, the entire plan of Sally Agarwal was that if suppose, you now this his photo is put and an article is written about him, everyone will get to know that someone like this has come and no one will ask me a question. I'll be saved. <laughs> this, was, this was what she was thinking. So 22nd September, 20th September Prabhupada arrived. 22nd September morning, Butler, Eagle newspaper talked about Prabhupada. And there, the headline said, Ambassador of Bhakti Yoga. See how Krishna arranges, right? <laughs> this is Krishna's plan. <laughs> this is Krishna's plan. Now with time, Prabhupada got settled in that place and they got settled with Prabhupada. And it's described 
Prabhupada's behavior in the house. Now hear this carefully. Now Prabhupada is an alien person there and they are alien to Srila Prabhupada. They are strangers for each other. But still, Prabhupada was very, very friendly. Sally Agarwal, you know, she says in an interview that uh, you know, he was very, very friendly. And how much friendly, you know? He would be very humorous talking to people around. Whoever would come to the house of Sally Agarwal, Gopal Agarwal, he would be very, very friendly. He would talk to them very nicely. And the best thing that he would do is he will remember the name of that person. And next time when the person comes, he would address the person with his name. And the person would feel very nice. <laughs> like this, you know, Prabhupada would uh, come out you know, even in the neighborhood of the Agarwal family's house. And he would uh, talk to people. And uh, you know, he would wave his hand when someone is going in the car. I mean, you know, whom he has talked to. So like this was very, very, very friendly. So Sally Agarwal, she says that he was the most easiest guest to handle. And the reason also she gives because whenever I'd be doing some work, he would be chanting. When I'd be taking care of my kids, he would be chanting. When I'll be cleaning, he would be chanting. When I'd be taking care of laundry, he would be chanting. It was very, very easy to handle. He did not need my attention. And I could see that he's chanting and he's happy. So I, I felt very, very nice. You know, this is what she says. <laughs> <laughs> this is what she says. And every afternoon, Prabhupada would cook lunch. Now it is described that in the fridge, there was non veg also kept. And then uh, Prabhupada would open that. And uh, you know, Sally would feel very, very bad because she was knowing he's a vegetarian. But uh, and Prabhupada would say, never mind, it's okay, it's okay. And then Prabhupada would remove very carefully the vegetarian uh, stuff, and then he would go for cooking. So there it is described that uh, Prabhupada, with his own hands, every single day for the time he stayed there, every afternoon he would cook lunch for the entire family. Gopal Agarwal, Sally Agarwal and the two kids. And there, you know, the description comes that everyone was really very happy to have that lunch together. And they became so close to Prabhupada, so close, that uh, they were not ready to live without him. That was the mood now. And Prabhupada was also very comfortable you know, with this family. So Sally Agarwal started treating Prabhupada's father as her father-in-law. And they had a very, very tight bonding with each other now. It is described that this personality, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, at the age of 70, he was cooking. At the same time, he used to wash his own clothes also. He used to wash his clothes, put it for drying. Every single day he was doing that. So the, the younger son of Gopal Agarwal, his name was Braj. He was seven months old. And for the first time, he stood in front of Shla Prabhupada. He was crawling and he stood up for the first time. Prabhupada was very happy. Prabhupada started clapping. He went there, he took him up. And there, Sally Agarwal says it was a celebration in the house. <laughs> celebration. And the elder one was a daughter. Elder means you know, she was just going to some kindergarten or something. So for the first time, she learned about Jesus in the kindergarten. Uh, in that Sunday school, she learned about Jesus. And then she comes back home and then she looks at uh, Prabhupada and she says, Swami Jesus, Swami Jesus, Swami Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and from that day onwards, she started calling Prabhupada Swami Jesus. <laughs> so this was there. So there was a nice family atmosphere. Everything was settled. And then Prabhupada started giving sessions around. One time sessions to the community groups, the Lions Club, you know, which was there. Some college was there. He gave sessions there. And the guests who would come home to Gopal Agarwal's house, there also he would uh, give sessions. There Prabhupada got one confidence that people were receptive and they were able to understand what he's speaking. So Prabhupada got some confidence you know, when uh, he started speaking. Now after this, Prabhupada was thinking, see, one-time sessions are of no use. I need a place where I have to preach. I have to set up an entire international movement. How can I do that? You now sitting here, you know, having giving one-to-one -one session. Now just see, Everything was settled in the place. Prabhupada could have stayed there for three months and then gone back to India. But Prabhupada decided after one month to leave that place. To leave Butler. Butler, Pennsylvania, Gopal Agarwal's house, he planned to leave. And he wanted to go to New York. Now, when he said this to Gopal and Sally, they were not able to believe that this person who has become so close to us is going to leave us now. They tried convincing him. But Prabhupada was very staunch and very determined with his goal that I am here to preach the message of Krishna and I have to do something. So Prabhupada said, I'll go to Philadelphia. There uh, there was one uh, professor called Dr. Norman uh, Brown. 
at the university of pennsylvania he was a sanskrit uh, doctor uh, i mean sanskrit professor or something he wanted to propal wanted to meet him and then if nothing works there he wanted to go to uh, new york after that so when uh, propal declared this everyone in the house was very sad because everyone was very attached to him so before uh, he was leaving gopal agarwal gave him some coins in a sock and then he taught shila propal how to put coins in the slot at the bus station to take bath he was proper to take bath multiple times right so uh, he taught him that how to put the coin in that slot and at the bus station how to take bath and then he taught him uh, now what to eat and what not to eat so he was telling all these things and finally with uh, a very heavy heart gopal agarwal dropped shila propal at pittsburgh bus station and from there propal took a bus to philadelphia uh, to uh, new york why philadelphia hmm. so he left at 2 am in the morning on 18th of october now things didn't work in philadelphia hmm. so he started for new york now see in new york he does not know anyone okay he does not know anyone the only thing is he had one contact in new york which he had got from his friend in bombay so now you can imagine his friend's friend so you can imagine how far distant relation this is and he has never talked to him he just wrote a letter from butler that uh, you know i'm planning to come and then you know it is said that after that he also phoned him and he talked with him saying uh, uh, i want to come here and that personality's name was dr ram ram murthy mishra he was a yoga teacher so he said okay no problem please come please come and then uh, he went there so at port authority bus terminal he got down now again propa does not know where to go so dr mishra had sent a student of his own and he received shila propa and from there from the bus terminal propa was taken to a, directly to an indian festival that was currently going on there so they were taken there and propa was seeing you know the indian festival that is going on and there he was introduced to dr mishra dr ram murthy mishra and then dr ram murthy mishra took him to his house and his house was on 14th floor in 33 riverside drive you know, that is the name of the place uh, that was besides a river called hudson now on this 14th floor propa describes that the windows were you know really big and the air was very nice this was the description that propa gives now propa is 70 but dr ram murthy mishra is 40 44 is something like around 44 and ram murthy mishra was a very very modern sort of person he was wearing nehru jacket white slacks and uh, and his gestures and everything was very very jazzy and you no know, flashy and in that way he would talk to propad in a nice accent of west and he was a very very trendy teacher of yoga and people would call him uh, you know a trendy guru or something like that yes and at that time this doc- dr ramurthy mishra was very sick actually very sick he was, his health was going down and for your information dr ramurthy mishra was a mayavadi <laughs> Now you can imagine how much Prabhupada chastises Mayavadis in his class. Mayavadi means the impersonalist. So Dr. Nam Murthy Mishra is a Mayavadi, and he is going to host Shri Prabhupada. But still, when it comes to philosophy, Prabhupada was heavy. He would fight with him. But when it comes to taking care of him, Prabhupada was really very motherly. So Dr. Nam Murthy Mishra he says in one of the interviews that uh, Prabhupada cured his health. and only because of propa that i could recover only because swami ji i could recover and the thing that recovered me was his food and that was not just food that was krishna prasadam he says and the love and devotion with which he was serving krishna and the same affection and love he was showing towards dr ram murthy mishra this is the heart of a pure devotee this is the heart of a pure devotee yes he doesn't see who the person is he just wants to serve yes and wherever he is he would like to serve krishna but then you know after a few weeks when this dr ramurthy mishra he recovered he started finding shla propa to be a, a to be a obstacle an inconvenience to him so he decided to shift him to his studio the hatha yoga studio the studio was there on the fifth floor the it was the number was 501 and the street was 100 west 72nd street near the central park now this is what is the description given and there was a small room in that uh, hatha yoga studio but that room didn't have any windows and that room was okay not very comfortable 
And that room was given to Srila Prabhupada. So he started staying there. So Prabhupada would come to the studio and he would see what uh, this person is speaking. And he would speak Mayavad completely. That everything is Brahman. We are a God. And only thing is, when the illusion is removed, we'll merge. We'll understand that we are God and we'll merge with the Brahman. And things like that. He'll go on speaking. And once Prabhupada got an opportunity to speak, Sir Ramurthy Mishra, he was not knowing who Prabhupada was, what he would speak. He gave opportunity to him. And Prabhupada came on the stage and he started speaking Krishna consciousness. Krishna is supreme personality of Godhead. We are all individual souls and we are all his servants. And Ramurthy Mishra is getting panicked. Are Babra, what is he speaking? This is not what I, I teach my students. After that, he never allowed Prabhupada to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Only thing that he would allow Prabhupada to do is that uh, after he would give class, he would call Swamiji, please come. Can you do some Kirtan? And only for that he would call. So what Prabhupada would be doing is he would be sitting at the back. And when the class would be going on at that time, Prabhupada would preach to the back benches, <laughs> saying that whatever he's saying is false. You listen to me what I'm saying. <laughs> this is what uh, you know, he would be saying. So in this way, you know, we see, you know, he spent some time in Dr. Mishra's place. They'd fight a lot with each other when it comes to philosophy. But again, they would come together. This is called as our Vedic culture. We might have difference in philosophy, but when it comes to, you know, staying as humans, there's a lot of love and affection. This is what our Vedic culture teaches us. This is what our Vedic culture teaches us, right? So in this way, we see this is what uh, we saw in, you know, Prabhupada's case also. So sometimes Prabhupada would go out and, you know, have a walk around in Manhattan. And there he met one uh, subway conductor. His name was Mr. Rubin. So Prabhupada would be sitting uh, you know, on one of the chair in the park. And then once uh, Mr. Rubin, he approached him and then he started talking because Prabhupada was in his attire of you know, uh, sannyasi and anyone who would get, attract, get attracted to that saffron clothes. So he went there and he started talking. Mr. Rubin started talking to him. And then he asked, who are you? And where have you come from? And Prabhupada started saying, that I'm AC Bhaktivedanta Swami. I've got many temples. I've got many books. I've got many disciples. Only time is separating. <laughs> <laughs> then Mr. Rubin speaks in one of the interviews. He says that uh, he was a lonely person, but he was speaking really very high thing. <laughs> so in this way, we see that Prabhupada was really confident that he will be able to establish the mission. Very, very confident. And what was the thing that was giving him confidence? The words of his Guru and the words of Srimad Bhagavatam and Krishna himself in the form of his holy name. This is the faith that a devotee should develop in his life. And we see this in the life of Srila Prabhupada. Now we have, uh, you know, we read some Bhagavatam and we have gone through some Bhagavad Gita classes also. All that we can see coming live and that, uh, that too in a contemporary person, a contemporary Acharya. We are seeing all that thing coming live here. Once there was a complete blackout. Complete blackout. And this was in November. November 9th, 6 p.m. onwards, there was a blackout, it seems. Hmm? And Prabhupada saw and then he started thinking, in India, power cuts are okay, but why power cut is here? <laughs> there was some problem and the entire uh, place was blacked out. There was no power at all. And you know what Prabhupada was doing? He was peacefully sitting and chanting. <laughs> Whereas the entire place was going into hustle and bustle and people were not understanding what to do. They were stuck at various places. They are locked down at various places. <laughs> yes. But Prabhupada was sitting and chanting peacefully till next day morning. Next day morning, uh, I think some uh, 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, the light came, the power came back. Something like that is described. All these things is goody goody to hear. But now there is something terrible that is happening. What is that? Prabhupada started on September. September, uh, he started from there. Uh, sorry, August he started from there and he came to Boston in September. Now he has got a visa for how many months? Three months. September, October, November has started. Now I can imagine his visa is going to get expired. Now desperately Prabhupada is writing letter to different, different people in India. And simultaneously he was searching for a building. Now he's a pauper. He does not have any single penny. He doesn't have money. Still is going out and searching for a place you know, for a temple. He would go and see the place. Okay, this place is okay, but then no, it's not big enough you know, for the temple. He would go, okay, this place is good. That place is best. And Prabhupada saw one place and he liked that place. And he started writing letters to his god brothers in India. Mm -hmm. Tirtha Maharaj, he wrote a letter to Tirtha Maharaj. 
who was uh, the lead of uh, Gaudiya Math in Mayapur. Then he wrote a letter to Sumati Murarji. He wrote a letter to Indira Gandhi. He wrote a letter to Padabhat Singhania. He wrote a letter to so many people. But from nowhere he got a positive reply. Everywhere you know, there was unfavorable reply that was coming. Then November passed, December came. Somehow, by the mercy of Krishna, he got his visa extended for another three months. Now he has ju just got another three months to go. And what is he supposed to do? Establish International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And what does he have now? 40 rupees in hand. That's it. And some you know, that dollars which he got from selling that book. And he has got his books. Now the only way that he can do was sell his books, get some money. And at the same time, find some people who can help him. Currently, he has nothing. Currently, he has nothing. He has not achieved anything in three months till now. Okay. But there in his diary, he says, I am successful. And you know what, what success Prabhupada is talking about? Prabhupada says, I was successful. Why? Because all the time I was remembering Krishna, even in New York winters. I forgot to tell you this incident. So for the first time, it snowed. There's no snowfall. And the next day morning when Prabhupada opened, the open, opened uh, when he came out to see Prabhupada was like, who has whitewashed the entire place? <laughs> An Indian for the first time is seeing the snow. And he was, it was literally very cold. Prabhupada was there in Zoti Kurta and you know, a jacket. So there, you know, in that New York winters, November winters, Prabhupada is writing that my success was, I was remembering Krishna all the time. He writes, not even a single day went by when I didn't work on my Srimad Bhagavatam. Every single day he was doing that, every single day. And then he says that never ever, never a day came when I didn't offer food to Krishna and never a day came when I didn't speak about Krishna. This is actually success. This is actually success in a devotee's life. This is what Prabhupada is saying. So in our life also, if you properly analyze, whatever we are achieving currently materially, that is not success. If we can remember Krishna all the time, if we can do devotional service in all the circumstances, be it good or be it bad, and if you are able to chant, if you are able to read Bhagavatam, come in association with devotees, then we can say it's success. Getting all these things is not success. Getting all this material stuff is not success. This is what Prabhupada is saying. <laughs> this is what he is saying. Prabhupada was finding in Dr. Mishra's that studio, he was not uh, allowed to speak, so he was not feeling good there because he was on a preaching mission. And he started feeling suffocating there because he wanted to preach and no one is allowing him to preach. No one is allowing him to speak there in Butler, Pennsylvania. It was a different type of uh, uh, suffocation because just he was giving one time session to everyone and he was not giving continuous sessions. And here there was a different type of suffocation. He was not allowed to speak only. So finally he decided that he'll move to his own place. He doesn't have money by the way. Let me tell you. So what he did was he chose a room. Two floors down, the same building. So 501 he was staying, he shifted down, two floors down to room number 307. And he started staying there. It is described that room was very, very small, no facilities at all, no kitchen, no bathroom. And the rent was $72. So he had to pay, he had to pay $72 now, every single month. So what he would do is that, uh, no, he would go to Dr. Mishra's house for kitchen and for bathroom. For these two, he would go to Dr. Mishra's apartment. But now, till now, if you see, Dr. Mishra was taking care of all the funding for Prabhupada. Now Prabhupada was on his own. Now what Prabhupada was doing was, he was going around with Bhagavatam, keeping in different, different stalls, book stalls, in different places. And every single day he would go and check. He would go and check if the books have been sold or not. This is what he would be doing. Now you see his expenses have increased. He has to pay the rent. And then when it comes to physical comfort, that also is reduced. But one, one solace was there that he was free to preach. This was there. And then he was going around and checking in different, different bookstalls if uh, the books have been sold. And another solace you know, to him was he would go to those libraries where the books were kept and he would go and take that book and then the library and he would open that card, the library card and he would see how many people have read this book? And it would feel very nice if some people have read. <laughs> you would feel, oh, okay, people have started reading my books. So in this particular room, the first few students were 
Dr. Mishra students. <laughs> those those few students started coming to uh, Prabhupada uh, to hear him. And one of them, they gifted him a tape recorder, a reel to reel tape. And in that, Prabhupada recorded some very solitary bhajans. We would play Kartal and then he would sing bhajans, and that was recorded in that. And for the first time, he recorded introduction to Gita Upanishad, that is, introduction to Bhagavad Gita. He recorded that in the tape recorder. And he had got an instruction from his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, that even if there is no one, you speak to the walls, but you speak. So Prabhupada was follow these instructions. This is called Guru Nishtha. Can you see? At every place we are seeing how much Guru Nishtha Prabhupada has. Whatever his spiritual master has said, he wants to do that. This is how a person can progress in Bhakti. This is the key. This is the key. Having Guru Nishtha. Following exactly what you know, the Guru is saying. Diksha Guru, Shiksha Guru. What they are saying, you know, that, that's what uh, is, a, is a key to progress on the path of Bhakti. And then Prabhupada started, Prabhupada started uh, his uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday sessions. And uh, the students started coming from Dr. Mishra's place only. And Prabhupada started speaking uh, on these three days. They would come and sit. Now, it was not an easy task to give a class to these foreigners. It is described that... Uh, the attention span of foreigners is very, very less. It was very difficult. You know, when Prabhupada would speak, so another the people who would be sitting, they were doing their own job. And Prabhupada would again and again say, pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm speaking something important. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me attentively. Prabhupada would beg to all of them. But they, they were least bothered because they were just guests. They were not uh, disciples of Prabhupada. And once Prabhupada started speaking about Krishna, they started saying, he started saying, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I'm sure you know about Krishna. And he saw a complete silence. And there's a complete question mark on the face of each and every person sitting there. Prabhupada asked another question. Have you seen Krishna's photo? There's a big question mark on everyone's face. And Prabhupada's volume of his voice reduced. And Prabhupada started thinking, that these people don't know who Krishna is. Now can you imagine whom Prabhupada was preaching to? <laughs> For us, it's very easy. You know, as Indians, you know, very easy you know, to talk about ISKCON. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people blaspheme ISKCON also. Yes, that uh, ISKCON started in West and the only goal was to get money. And uh, from India, a lot of money goes to West. Mm -hmm. And so many nonsense things people speak. Only people who are there in Iskon and who read about Prabhupada and understand his character and understand what he went through, they'll understand that all this is just a rumor. All this is just, uh, I'm getting various words, but I don't want to use. All this is just uh, stupidity and nothing else. Yes. Those people who speak ill about uh, Iskon, for sure, you know, it's very easy to speak, but they don't know what the Acharya have gone through. And if the Acharya is going through so much of pain in the entire preaching, so the principles that he'll set in that organization will be very, very high level, very high standard. And in such an organization, stupid things cannot happen, what people talk about. Right? So in this way, we see that this person, Prabhupada, is so genuine that he's preaching to whom? To people who have not heard the name Krishna. And what is he going to speak about? Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and what is he speaking about? Bhagavad Gita spoken by Krishna. My God, it is very difficult to comprehend also what preaching you might be doing. Like first day when you all came you know, to the Bhagavad Gita class. So the speaker was confident that these people might have heard about Krishna. They know what is Bhagavad Gita. And in fact, it was seen that many people knew the shlokas. And it was very easy to connect with people. People knew what is Atma, what is Paramatma. But here people don't know who is Krishna. And to such audience, Prabhupada is going to preach. They started preaching and they are not at all interested to hear, but they are still coming. There was some attraction to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was very attractive. So they were coming to hear. So this was happening in uh, room number 307 in that particular uh, building. But there was a different place, a restaurant called The Paradox mm -hmm. on 64th East 7th Street. So currently what we were talking about was on uh, 100 West 72nd Street. Now we're talking about another place, which is uh, on, uh, oh, where is that? 64th East, 7th Street. Hmm? And this is on the east side, lower east side. 
So this was a restaurant, specially meant for some spiritual discussions. No, that was a free place. Lot of tea was provided there. People would come drink tea, unlimited tea, and they would have some spiritual discussion. Looks like. So there, the people who would come to doc from Dr. Mishra's place to Prabhupada, they would also come here also into this place, the paradox. And there, they started speaking about the Swami. They started started talking about the sessions by Shri Prabhupada. There were two people, especially Harvey Cohen and Bill Epstein. So these two people were talking about Prabhupada. So Bill Epstein was worker at uh, Paradox. So both of them they started talking about Prabhupada. And everyone you know, started to know, and it was a wildfire you know, that was spread all around, saying a new Swamiji has come from west, from east, and he is speaking about spiritual philosophy. And then, uh, now few of them started going. Few of them started going and attending sessions there. But then they started thinking, if Swamiji comes to the lower east side when he shifts to this place. Many people here actually need him. And you know who those people were? They were the hippies, the drunkards, the women monglers, the meat eaters, the ones who have left the house, yes, and uh, the ones who are really crazy in their behavior due to taking drugs, and the ones who are called as bumps means the ones who are completely drunk and who are just lying here and there. Yes, this was the crowd, and Prabhupada decided you not know, to uh, when when he was hearing you know, from his students about this. Prabhupada was considering, but one day an incident happened where Prabhupada decided that he has to leave that place, <clears throat> room number three zero seven. So Prabhupada had gone out to some place to distribute the books. So when he came back, already there was nothing with Prabhupada, but still a theft had happened happened in his room. So his only typewriter was stolen, and his only tape recorder in which the introduction to Bhagavad Gita and some other chapters were recorded that was stolen. And Prabhupada became very much morose, very much morose. The the housekeeping staff there, the janitor, he actually told that uh, okay, the theft has happened. Prabhupada could make out, you know, from his face, that person's face, that he is the theft, he is the thief. But he didn't have any proof, you know, to prove that. So he just, uh, you know, he decided that there's no point in living here. So I have to leave from here. So when he decided that, you know, he has to leave from from that particular place. So that time. There was some electrician there working in that building. He he warned him. He told him that uh, uh, this place, you know, where you are planning to shift, hmm, is a very very dangerous place, very dangerous place, and is the worst place in the entire country here. I would suggest you not to go. Yes, but still, you know, Prabhupada had no option, so Prabhupada, uh, you know, decided that you know he'll go there to, the, to that place. This place was called as the Bowery, the place of all hippies. Now Harvey and Bill, these were the two people who were actually planning to shift Prabhupada you know, to that place. So Harvey was going to shift to California. So Harvey told Prabhupada that you can shift you not know, to the loft in the Bowery where I'm staying, where I was staying, and that particular place was shared by another person called David. Remember these names; you'll be needing these names to relate. So David was staying in that place. And Harvey said that Prabhupada, you can stay in my place. Or no, they were calling him as Swamiji. Swamiji, you can stay in my place in this Bowery loft, and because I'll be shifting to California, I'll not be here. Now Prabhupada is going to shift to Bowery. Bowery is that place where all these people are there. They're all young, long hair, crazy, always on drugs. Most of them were nude. Mm, they were wearing half nude clothes and some of them were full nude yes no etiquettes at all they had no sense of respect and there the slogan was don't believe a person who has crossed the age of 35 and what is the age of propath 70 now propath is going to a place where people have already decided not to believe in a person who has crossed 35 and here is a person who is double the age mm-hmm. and he is going to shift to that place and there propas actual preaching is going to start now the preaching amongst or the preaching in the crowd of hippies how propas started his preaching what all things he did and how he preached to these hippies and how i don't know if we will be able to register his con 
But if possible, we'll try to register this con also. How Prabhupada registered this con? Yes. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. So let's meet tomorrow. Tomorrow, same time, 7 o'clock. Hare Krishna. Jagat Guru Shri Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.